and it's the final trading day of October 2023, 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning, live from Channels HQ right here in Lagos. Uh, let's get the top stories that set your agenda today. We'll see oil prices um, rose in early Asian trade uh, today ahead of global central bank meetings and as tensions in the Middle East remain high. Uh, Brent crude futures uh, rose 46 cents to $87.91 a barrel, while U.S. Uh, West Texas Intermediate crude, that climbed 33 cents, about 0.4 percent to $83.64 a barrel. Oil fell more than 3 percent on Monday's Israel's attacks on Gaza escalated, although fears ease that Israel Hamas war would uh, disrupt supply from the region. Israeli troops and tanks attacked Gaza's main northern city from the east and west uh, yesterday, three days after it began ground operations in the Palestinian enclave. Uh, traders were also keeping a close eye on global monetary policy with rate-setting meetings of major central banks scheduled for this week. And to the global grains market now, we see Chicago wheat futures fell as supply concerns ease, but prices still um, headed for their first monthly rise since uh, July after dry conditions uh, damaged yields in Argentina and Australia, raising the prospect of a tighter market. Soybeans and corn also slipped, with soy set for a monthly gain and uh, corn little change over the month. Uh, to the price action now, see the most active wheat contract on the Chicago Board of Trade, WV1, uh, was 0.5% lower about five dollars uh see it was up four percent uh for the month cbot soybeans sv1 was down 0.4 percent at 13 dollars two cents a bushel uh 2.1 percent higher this month uh corn cv1 was in change at four dollars 78 cents for a quarter of a bushel uh, we'll drill down on expectations for the commodity markets later on on the show and back here, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has announced plans to allow easy visa access for Nigerian businesses and strengthen bilateral relations between both countries. The German leader, who is visiting Nigeria for the first time since assuming office in December 2021, uh, made this known yesterday when he met business leaders at a conference in Lagos as part of his two-day working visit to Nigeria. Mr. Scholz is the second European leader to visit the country since the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war began in February last year. Take a listen. It's the German-Nigeria Business Conference holding in Lagos as one of the activities for the German Chancellor, Mr. Olaf Scholz, who is on a working visit in the country. The Nigeria-German Chamber of Commerce is the host here and has brought together manufacturers, industrialists, economists and stakeholders in the trade value chain between Nigeria and Germany. We are not just here to discuss business. We are here to strengthen the bonds between Nigeria and Germany, to facilitate trade and to spark innovation that will drive our economies. This conference serves as a catalyst for building stronger and more prosperous relationships. Okay, someone standing, does someone have a microphone? After the speech of the President of the Chamber, members of the audience then bear their minds on issues which have been militating the expansion of their businesses. The panel to give answers is made up of the special guest, the German Chancellor, and the Deputy Governor of Lagos State. The first issue is electricity supply. You have a chain, right? And that chain as a Jenko, I produce power, I sell to you, you distribute to the customer. You as the disco collects the money. I don't have visibility to your customers. And then getting, get, for me to get my money, I go through you. So we need to look at that chain. We need to look at that chain and how do we make sure that we distribute, even if you can utilize 80 percent of what we produce today then that means you'll be getting almost 12,000 megawatts compared to the 4,000 so that's about 200 percent improvement so we need to get the economics right you uncover for the chancellor the promise for an easier visa process is a message he has brought here we are digitalizing the whole process this is what will be finished in the end of uh, the next year 
and for some countries, and Nigeria is one of them, it will be finished uh, also in the beginning of next year, where we then have a chance to organize the access to visa much easier than it is today. As the visit of the Chancellor to Nigeria ends, business operators with interest in German products and services will be looking forward to the digitization of the visa process as a takeaway from his visit. And the European Union and the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, earlier this month signed seven agreements worth about 212.4 million euros on promotion of trade and regional integration, energy interconnectivity and renewable energy. Joining us to shed more light says uh, Linda Ahibe, uh, Communications Advisor to the President of ECOWAS Commission. Uh, great to have you on the show and congratulations on your recent appointment. Thank you so much, Ladi. Good to be here. Fantastic. Great to have you on that side. Well, let's um, uh, get into it now. Can you provide an <laughs> overview of the seven agreements signed between the European Union and ECOWAS? That's about 212.4 uh, million uh, euros and highlight their key focus areas. So essentially, this agreement between ECOWAS and the EU is to promote, you know, integration, economic development and growth, you know, in the West African sub-region, as well as food security and, the, and to enhance the electricity value chain among member countries. The agreement, the financing agreement, what, you know, the, the amount you talked about is in different areas. The first one is the African trade competitiveness and market access, which is 50 million euros. Euros. And this agreement is intended to reduce or eliminate trade barriers, make MSMEs more competitive, you know, enhance the capacity of SMEs, SMS, SMEs to export along the export value chain, as well as, you know, help them to negotiate the, the complex trade regula uh, regulations along the way, which makes it difficult for them to export. Another agreement is the trade in services in sub-Saharan Africa, which is 11.5 million euros. And this is essentially to enhance intra-regional, intercontinental trade, as well as trade with, with the between African, West African countries and EU. We also have investments in the energy sector. Essentially, this is worth 25 million euros and it is to advance the electricity, the regional electricity market by improving the share of renew, renewable energies. We know this will be launched um, next, uh, next month, this renewable, this electricity market where West African countries can begin to trade in electricity. Then there's the regional clean cooking um, strategy, which is 12 million euros and this is to encourage clean sustainable affordable cooking solutions as a way of you know protecting the lives of people in the region in terms of mitigating the harmful effects of, of climate change. We also have, have agreements covering migration and free movement of persons within the, sub, within, within the West African sub-region, which is one of the major objectives of ECOWAS, which it plans to, to meet, as well as the regional program to support pastoral economy, which is worth 60 million euros and which is intended to support livestock production in the West African sub-region. Right, quite, quite a number of agreements um, there, but uh, in what ways do the signed agreements, you know, contribute to stabilizing the ECOWAS um, region, particularly uh, through the promotion of um, economic uh, cooperation? And so when you talk about stabilizing, we know that some factors which promote the stabilization of the region is food insecurity, economic downturn, and so these agreements are channeled, are to be channeled into these areas to boost food security in terms of increasing the capacity of member states, the storage capacity of member states, and also increase, you know, their capacity to fight food insecurity. And also, you know, eliminating trade barriers, ensuring that countries, member countries, are able to export and increase the trade between ECOWAS member states, you know, to the, the trade export, the exports of ECOWAS member states to um, outside the, the, the continent, and also to equip, you know, SMEs with the skills to 
to navigate the complex trade regulations which exist, help them standardization, help them to understand how to effect, you know, how to meet the standards, to meet the export standards, because when you're exporting goods and, and products from West Africa abroad, there are certain standards that need to be met. And, you know, some SME, SMEs have had issues with these standards and these regulations. So financing is going into these areas to equip them with capacity to be able to meet the standards. So essentially, this would help with diversification in ECOWAS member countries, increase trade, and boost the economy. And what specific measures are outlined in the agreement, you know, regarding, you know, free movement of uh, persons and uh, migration? We see that's pegged about 34 million euros, you know, to maximize the development potential within ECOWAS countries and promote a secure and um, rights-based regional integration process. And so, Yolati, you know that each member country has their own um, migration policies. And so, this financing will go into harmonizing the migration policies of each member state, create avenues for member states to speak to each other, you know, on how this policy of migration and free movement of persons would work. The finance would also go into management of data, migration data, analyzing this data, as well as, you know, building the capacity of border officials in recognizing harmful migration practices like, um, like uh, migration, uh, migration of minors, illegal migration of minors, exploitation of minors, you know, and cross-border cross um, crime, as well as, you know, build the capacity of ECOWAS to begin to convene technical meetings on migration and movement of persons in the West African sub-region. Uh, what, what would you say is uh, uh, put in place to make sure that these agreements are a win-win for the ECOWAS and, and the EU? There's no, uh, no one is, you know, getting more advantage at this point. How, how do we make that happen? What will make that happen will be for, for the ECOWAS member, member countries to take advantage of these agreements, you know, get more SME, SMEs involved in all the, the financial agreements, particularly as regards um, trade, removal of trade barriers, so that more SMEs in these member countries can export, can export their goods intra-regional, intercontinental, and even outside, in, outside the continent. And also, you know, to remove really, really removing trade barriers, which is a very, very significant thing because these trade barriers have, you know, impeded the exportation of goods from West Africa to even within Africa and not to talk about, you know, outside the country. So it, it will be a win-win if, you know, the, this ECOWAS member states and ECOWAS as a body is able to take advantage of this financial agreement to their benefits. And what would you say, you know, the, the Nigerian government should, you know, be doing at this time to make sure that Nigeria as a country can benefit, you know, from these agreements? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that, Ladi. No, I'm saying, what should the Nigerian government be doing, you know, at this time to make sure that we actually, you know, benefit from this agreement signed between ECOWAS and the European Union? I think that Nigeria as a country should really be on the table when these agreements are being rolled out, when these financial agreements you know, are being rolled out, be on the table, engage in all the technical sessions, you know, because this would have, there'll be lots of meetings when these things are being implemented. So engage in the technical sessions, be on the table and make sure that, you know, you pay attention to what is being said and find out ways where Nigeria can key into this agreement, involve civil society, because we know that some of these agreements would involve building the capacity of civil society organizations. So we also need civil society organizations in Nigeria to key into all these programs for, you know, to key into all these programs essentially. All right, the, the regional clean cooking action in West Africa, as a RACOA agreement, allocates about 12 million euros. How does this initiative intend to increase you know, access to clean, efficient, and sustainable cooking um, energy solutions in, in West Africa? And uh, what strategies are, are proposed for financing and promoting businesses, uh, business models in this sector? 
Yeah, so you said it, you know, one of the key objectives of this clean cooking solutions is to advance innovative financing and, you know, and business models, which essentially would ensure that clean cooking, this clean cooking, um, clean, um, excuse me, clean cooking uh, mechanisms and strategies are commonplace, that more entrepreneurs come into the system and take part in the entire value chain from the production, distribution and consumption of these clean cooking strategies. Definitely, you know, uh, Nigerians are dealing with uh, rising energy costs, you know, at this time, uh, consumers are squeezed on all sides and having to pay so much for, for gas, for fuel and, and all of that. So looking at these agreements, um, right, how do they, um, you know, strategically, you know, help uh, at this point to reduce the burden on uh, consumers at this time? We know, we know that one of the agreements has to do with clean energy and the electricity, the regional electricity market. And we know that next month, ECOWAS would be launching, you know, this um, electricity market where African countries can begin to trade electricity. And we hope that with this, this will reduce, you know, this would help to combat the issues of electricity generation on the continent and in Nigeria. All right, thank you so much, uh, Linda Ibe, communications advisor to the president of um, ECOWAS uh, Commission. Thank you so much uh, for your input today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ladi. All right, so taking the conversation uh, further now, see, according to data from the National Bureau of Statistics, the Nigerian oil and gas uh, industry, for the first time on record, uh, attracted zero foreign investment in the second quarter of 2023. Let's find out how we can redefine the future of the oil and gas energy uh, sector in Nigeria. And uh, join us for this conversation right here in the studio is Ozioma Agu, Partner, Energy, Finance, Infrastructure, Strength and Plan uh, Partners. It's great having you here on the show. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So um, last week, I did have that business adaptability summit and you know, wide-ranging uh, conversations, you know, had uh, at the summit. Um, break it down for me, your key takeaways from the summit. Thank you. So I think one thing was very clear from the summit. Um, we need very clear policies in Nigeria. We need um, stable policies to drive um, the different sectors, oil and gas sector, the power sector, the financial services sector, you know, because... It is only when we have these stable policies that the investors can actually um, get comfortable investing in the sectors. So we need to um, reform our policies and not just reforming our policies, we also need to reform our institutions because it's one thing to you know, enact these policies, it's another thing to have um, institutions that will be ready to implement these policies. So I think that that's one of the key things, you know, reforming our policies and um, having institutions that are ready to implement these policies for the benefit of the in investors. And again, just to mention, um, I, I think um, during the summit, I was very particular about um, making policies that are very practical, right? Because it, we tend to, my experience, right, being um, um, a policy advisor in this country is that sometimes the government tends to isolate the policies from the realities on ground. So we need to understand, you know, the practicality of the policies that we are um, formulating for all the sectors, especially the oil and gas sector and the financial services sector. How will this impact the consumers, the investors, so that at the end of the day, we are not just churning out policies that will be difficult to implement. And yeah. looking at that um, data from the MBS, zero capital attracted in the second quarter in the oil and gas uh, sector, what is this telling us really at this time? Yeah, so I mean, uh, still goes to the issue of investors not being happy and being discouraged uh, because they are not getting um, 
enough return on their investment. I think that investors are afraid of our FX liquidity. The market has, um, the FX market has depleted so much in the past couple of months that there has to be um, a very critical intervention by the government. And I know that there are plans on the way. Um, I even read in the news recently um, that there are plans to stabilize, um, to issue policies that will actually stabilize the FX before the end of December. And we are hopeful that that works, you know, practically speaking, because we have um, business people, right, that have taken loans from the banks. And now the value of these loans have deteriorated so much because um, the FX, the value of the FX, right, vis-a-vis -vis the Naira in the market has gone so low. So repatriating this money, taking back the profits, you know, to their countries and to other investors in other places have become a problem for them. And when that happens, you're not able to see, you know, the profit in the business that you're doing. You're just running on costs. You know, so there, there are lots of businesses incurring costs, not uh, making profits on their investments because of the FX liquidity. And so I think that's a very critical thing that has to, you know, really be um, taken into consideration if we want to retain our investors and if we also want to retain our investors in the oil and gas um, 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 sector. It's quite incredible because I was speaking with my, my neighbor yesterday. He's a poultry farmer and uh, he's talking about the problems in their industry at this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And FX, same story, FX. And I'm looking for one industry in Nigeria that FX, this FX distortion is not uh, uh, impacting. And, you know, tell me about the key policy changes or implementations that should be considered to redefine this oil and gas sector because we, we heavily rely on it and it mm -hmm. will be um, quite unfortunate to play with it right now. Mm -hmm. So um, to start with uh, the energy sector in Nigeria, and when I say energy, it's oil and gas and power, has a lot of prospects, right? Um, the problem has not always been the country. It's about how we are running the country. Because even as we are complaining of, um, or if, even as we are you know, envisaging that there, there's going to be transition to cleaner energies and we're going to have um, a lot of... Um, oil and gas companies divesting from core you know, oil and gas exploration, we still um, see in the news that these oil giants are acquiring you know, upstream companies from, other, um, from states like the US because they are comfortable right, that they can put in their money to do this and they're going to get it back at the end of the day. So I think that we need to tackle things. Um, speaking of policy changes, we need to tackle things like oil theft. We need to tackle insecurity right, vandalization of the pipelines and, you know, oil theft so that um, the investors are not suffering for, you know, unduly. And then I also think that um, ease of doing business is very key, and I keep saying this. Um, we have to encourage local participation, right? We have to encourage the, um, the local companies to engage in these businesses and make it easy. We need to license them once they have actually shown the capacity to do this um, uh, uh, business. We have to license them, promote them, you know, encourage them to actually participate and partner with these other um, um, international oil companies to, you know, do the business. Because, you know, most, most of the time we're always looking to the government to mm -hmm. solve most of these issues. Everyone's looking to the government at this time. But um, talk to me about uh, the role of stake other stakeholders, you know, mm -hmm. experts, you know, policy advisors. What role do they play in, you know, helping shaping this uh, oil and gas sector in Nigeria? So their role is very critical, right, because um, uh, I, I always recommend that the government cannot, should not work in isolation. There has to be proper engagement with policy experts, with consultants, with people who, you know, work and see things from the perspective of the investors in these sectors. And um, so they, they, their roles are very critical um, in terms of formulating policies that are workable, policies that are very, um, you know, practical, and policies that can be implemented. Um, I, I think that um, what has to be done is proper engagement, you know, uh, involving these policy experts. We have so many of them in Nigeria. We have so many firms who can actually, you know, um, 
uh, provide these services, the government should be very conscious of it and not just, it shouldn't just be a government business alone. It has to be, um, has to be a proper alignment, right, between stakeholders of the affected industries and the government working together to ensure that whatever policy that is being, you know, produced will trickle down to the very last person in the value chain. And I'll give an example. Um, there's no reason why um, right now in the country we are trying to um, encourage local manufacturing. At the same time, we are making policies from the financial sector, financial services sector, that will encourage people to, you know, export, rather encourage people to actually import import these items that could be sourced locally. That's the 43 items readmission. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, the rationale when it was banned before was because, according to the CBN, because um, they wanted to encourage local participation. Now, I mean, it's important to open up the market, right, the official um, foreign exchange market for importation and all of that, but um, I don't know if proper engagement, right, has been done with the people in this manufacturing sector to actually ensure that this is not going to impact them negatively at the end of the day. And, you know, if you open up the market for people to import items that could be sourced locally, then are you not defeating the purpose? Because it's quite, it's, it's quite incredible because, yeah. you know, major you know, experts I spoke to mm -hmm. before the 43 items were admission, most of them were clamoring for those items to be readmitted so that to reduce the pressure you know, on, on the uh, parallel market um, window. But now that it's been done, nobody's happy with it at this time. Because it's going to discourage local manufacturing. So there has to be a balance, right? Um, it is not a policy that should be condemned because at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of pressure on the FX market and it has to be opened up, right? The market has to be freer so that we don't have people always rushing to the parallel market and making the prices surge. But at the end of the day, there has to be, it has to be, uh, you know, end to end proper alignment. If you're making this policy, consult with a policy, if you're making a policy that's going to affect people in the health sector, on the manufacturing sector, consult with stakeholders in these sectors so that you understand how you can fine tune it to serve everybody at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, before um, uh, uh, taking on any policy, meet with the stakeholders in the affected industries Correct. before you know, uh, coming out with the policies. Exactly. Quite interesting. So uh, talk to me now about um, you know, what you're seeing you know, coming in this industry. Right now we're de dealing with geopolitics. You know, we've seen how uh, the Israel-Hamas war is impacting you know, the global oil market and definitely all of that distortion is impacting our revenue here. We've seen oil prices actually drop, you know, this morning and uh, yesterday, big drops yesterday. So talk to me about how we can hedge, you know, against the distortions, you know, from the global oil market to keep this sector stabilized. I think we need to encourage um, local participation, right? Um, I understand the need to depend on foreign participation, but we're not doing a lot, right, to encourage the local participants. Because, I mean, check the, uh, the states that have um, refineries. A lot of refineries are not working. Some of these refineries are actually owned by local participants, right? So we need to promote local participation in the industry so that we can also develop that capacity to build our own markets and have a robust economy at the end of the day. So we need, apart from um, publishing, uh, formulating policies that works for everybody, we need to encourage local participation. We need to um, incentivize the system. We need to make business easy. We need to streamline the process. We don't have to suffer people who want to come into the industry and we don't have to suffer them unduly. We need to open up the market, make the market freer, allow people to determine the prices that govern their products as long as it does not have a devastating effect on the economy. Yeah. All right. So uh, with the way uh, we're going right now uh -huh. with uh, policies uh, right here in Nigeria, where are you seeing this industry, say, in the next five years? if we continue in this path? So, well, because there are, uh, I mean, there was an announcement by the president to, you know, deregulate the downstream sector, the, uh, and uh, there are a couple of other policies, you know, on the way. The reality is this, if we implement the Petroleum Industry Act, if there is a conscious implementation of the provisions in that act, 
um, inclusive of other regulations that are underway. There are a couple of NUPRC um, regulations that are underway. If we implement that, then I don't see a problem with the industry. The problem is always um, bringing out those regulations, these policies, these laws, and implementing them. I think that if we do that and encourage local participation, we'll be in a good place in five years. In five years. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to have your perspective. Oziyama Agro Partner, Energy, Finance, Infrastructure, Strength, and Bland Partners. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break now. When we come back, I'll check on, I'll get a check on the global commodities market, the equities market, and other markets. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. And for the commodities uh, market update, we have uh, Victoria Mormon, now senior analyst, financial uh, derivatives company. Great to have you on the show. Good morning. Good morning, Ladi. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. So we see uh, the federal government have approved a 2.18 trillion supplementary um, budget for the 2023 um, fiscal year. And I see um, increased spending on defense, welfare packages, and, uh, and all that. How, how do you see this impacting um, economic stability in Nigeria? Um, thank you very much for your question, Ladi. Um, so first and foremost, this supplementary budget is actually like um, a budget that has been, um, you know, brought on to actually cover, you know, the additional costs from the previous budget of 2023 that was released in um, December last year. Uh, but I would like you to know that um, uh, this supplementary budget is actually, you know, ought to have, um, you know, come before the 2024 budget, which um, was released, you know, as at last week or um, two weeks ago. And um, this is because um, there are quite a number of um, parameters or assumptions that have actually changed from um, the 2023 budget that was actually released as of last year, you know, in terms of um, the increase in revenue, you know, expenditure has spiked. We've seen reduction in um, fuel subsidy. We've also seen, you know, exchange rate parameters also change. So as a result of all of these changes, we've seen that um, a supplementary budget was actually, you know, needed. And then we saw the increase in, um, you know, the uh, amount for defense, you know, including into the supplementary budget so basically it's um you know more spending so um this supplementary budget actually is um 10 percent of last year's um budget and uh, when put side by side with inflation rate which is 25 percent uh, it means that um the budget as of last year has actually increased or the expenditure Detail as of last year has actually increased by you know you know over 25 percent so um in terms of um, you know you know arrangements or order of release for this budget, like I said, the supplementary budget of 2023, you know, which is for this year because the year has not ended just yet, was supposed to you know come first before you know the 2024 budget and even the uh, medium term expenditure framework for you know three that covers three years is actually you know supposed to you know actually follow through. And then, but in terms of the goals for the budget, we've uh, seen that the goals are actually clear. That is in the aspect of you know increasing you know revenue moderating inflation and also you know uh, bringing about overall macroeconomic stability but um in terms of um, you know policy announcement there is actually a lag between you know policy announcement and also you know the impact on the citizens all right victoria we see the oil market is uh was down big uh, yesterday we've seen a, a little bounce um this morning we're also seeing the naira uh, down uh, i did Think the Nara is beginning to to strengthen. What's driving sentiment uh, generally on that? Uh, so basically, Nara, like every other commodity, is actually a price, and uh, price is a function of demand. And um, in that case, we actually have the actual demand and uh, you know speculative demand. And uh, speculative demand are actually you know people that actually make or demand for the. Currency or take advantage of uh, the currency to make you know gains. Um, so, but we've seen like uh, quite a number of uh, pressure on the currency on the naira, and that has um, you know driven the naira to 
uh, cause the era to actually depreciate to an all-time low as at last week um but later on we've seen like a slight appreciation of the Nera. and um, i would also like you know attribute one of these reasons to uh you know false expectations that is in terms of um you know the 10 billion dollar that the federal government actually announced um the federal government planned to securitize dividends uh for the and and NLNG and um, that is expected to yield um, seven billion dollars. So because of this expectation, we saw um, people you know hold back and um, you know the speculation reduce and that you know helped Dinera. But in terms of the clarity of the sources of um, FX supply, there is still that um, gap and that is actually or that has actually um, caused you know the pressures in the market to actually return back and we've seen that in the decline or the depreciation of uh, Dinera. But one thing that I would like you to know as regards the um, dividends that is, um, is securitized and would amount to seven billion dollar is um uh, because there are also like questions you know regarding how long this um uh, this um seven billion dollars would actually you know control you know the volatility in the currency market and that is due to the fact that if you take a look at um you know the previous administration in eight years the uh, the NL, nlng actually yielded about you know 5.8 billion dollars for eight years so if eventually we are uh, you know securitizing these dividends to get seven billion dollars that is just to you know um um take control of the um temporary just provide temporary solution to the nera and then there are concerns as to how these um forex supplies would actually you know be brought in into the country in order to stabilize uh the nera and this um uh, this um concern is actually one of the things that people are looking out for and um, this is actually you know contributing to the falling nera and then we expect the volatility to continue in um the exchange rate market and this would you know basically you know continue to affect the commodities that are being imported into the into the country if you take a look at the domestic commodities you would see that um, um commodities that are imported into the country like sugar wheat they've um, recorded spikes and that is due to uh the currency depreciation and then we also had the domestically produced commodities that are also you know recording spikes uh due to you know forex pressures and also um uh, you know other inflation pressures in the country. All right, um, uh, talk to me about uh, the upcoming Global Central Bank uh, meetings now, especially the upcoming uh, Bank of Japan uh, meeting. We see the U.S. Federal Reserve and, and Bank of England. And um, what are they going to? How are they going to play into the oil price uh, movement? Uh, so basically, um, oil prices are, are down, and that is because there are like expectations of, um, or people are actually, or investors are actually like, um, you know, trading carefully ahead of the meetings that is coming up. For Fed meeting, we have the meeting coming up uh, tomorrow, November one. So would be would um, find out about the decision on whether there'll be a rate hike or a possible pause in um, uh, you know the interest rate, and that is you know affecting the global market as it stands now. But do not forget that there are also other factors that are you know contributing to the oil market, the oil prices, and um, that is um, the Israel Hamas conflict that is um, you know raising issues about um, a potential. You know, Know, supply shortage that could even drive the prices of brands upwards and then there is also um you know some countries that are uh, going through a uh, weak macroeconomic uh, that have weak macroeconomic fundamentals and that is actually you know expected to weigh on their demand for oil so we expect oil prices to be volatile in the near term and um, i mean this has an impact in the nigeria economy given the fact that we um you know oil is one of our major or our major exports you know, commodity. We expect that if oil prices fall, uh, it would affect our earnings, and if it rises, it would, you know, booster our earnings. All right. I guess uh, volatility is what we should be expecting right now. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria Mama Analyst, Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ladin. All right, now let's take it on to other markets. Now uh, we have um, any John McQua with the details for the local boss and fixed income market. Uh, great to have you, Ini. So quite an impressive um, outing yesterday in the market. Very impressive. <laughs> Very Big 1.4 uh, percent um, we, we jump see, there. We didn't see that coming. But right. We remember um, the issue with Egypt. We saw a lot of Egyptians hedging.
Right. You know, in the market, perhaps that's what happened yesterday. But exactly. I mean, I'm sorry. You just have to get my voice the way it is. I hope you can hear what I'm saying. I can but hear you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, let's head to the markets. Might not sound good that my voice, but I mean, <laughs> it was a good market yesterday. We saw the oil share up uh, 1.45%. And we can thank a lot of industrial goods for that because we saw Dangote Cement was up more, almost 6%, 5.6%. Standing, I think we have to drill down on that because like three times last week, we saw Standing getting a lot of bargain hunting. Yesterday it was up 9.2% and of course we saw the all share uh, reflected that at the end of the day and the all share we see gained 32.9%. Uh, let's see the sectors total volume yesterday. Oh, all right. Let's have uh, the sectors. There you have it. Banking was up Remember, Stan Bika, it's not part of the Fugas, but it's really driving that sector in recent time. Consumer goods was up 0.4%, industrial goods, Dangote Cement, uh, we, we said that earlier, 0.9% for insurance, and oil and gas seems to be back to its status, which is unchanged for some time. Market breath was very positive, very, very positive, 40, 40 has gained only 16 loss so uh, it was a very positive market and there you have a very green activity charts we had yesterday when last did you see deals at 7,000 7,656 and then we move over to the other market uh, we see that yesterday was a very good day for the money market the fixed income market yields yesterday there was a bond an OMO bond yesterday and it sold at its highest rates I think ever or you know a lot of analysts say it's reflecting the interest rate and probably we're getting to a situation where the CBN can manage you know inflow and outflow of cash in the economy using its rate uh, because we see that almost yesterday was at 21 percent and that's the biggest signal of interest rate adjustment well let's look at the bond also obviously to spread around so maybe now really the government can raise money from the local market you know for the budget funding uh, so it had 36 deals worth 23.1 billion can we see the other ones there treasury bills 13 and uh, obviously the um the auction was oversubscribed and uh, you have value at 13.49 billion naira so i guess we have to stop it there laddie but i i, I tell you the right. sad thing yesterday is that the naira dropped again at again. the graphics window yeah. to more than 900 992 uh, obviously not not a good one yeah well, we've been hoping for unification but not not that time not that kind of unification yeah. thank you so much mm -hmm. uh any thank you and sorry thank about you. your voice yeah thanks all right, let's uh, get a check on the sentiment uh, in London now. We have uh, Juliana join us from our London studio. Uh, great to have you, Juliana. Good morning. So we see the Bank of England uh, figures there reveal that mortgage approvals is at the lowest level since January. What's driving that? Good morning, Laddie. That's absolutely right. In fact, this is the third consecutive monthly decline of mortgage approvals, um, according to data from the Bank of England, which has been released earlier today. And really, I think this data just reflects the sentiment around the pretty tumultuous uh, mortgage sector in the UK at the moment. We know that this is being driven by high interest rates. Interest rates in the UK over the past 18 months have risen from 0.1% to 5.25%. So now, of course, we know all eyes are going to be on the Monetary Policy Committee when they gather on Thursday to decide interest rates. Um, it was put on hold last month to 5.25%. And I think the mood music in the City of London at the moment is that perhaps the policy rate um, changes will keep interest rates at the same at 5.25% because it is having a knock-on effect for so many different factors of the economy, but particularly um, the mortgage sector. Not only are we seeing um, that prospective buyers are putting off purchasing their first homes, we've seen that with data uh, from Rightmove, which is a, a property website overseeing uh, the market. And we're also seeing it with approvals from banks who, because of the cost of living crisis, um, they are not 
um, feeling the appetite for risk at the moment. So all um, focus is going to be on the MPC, not just to see whether or not they hike interest rates, but also to see what their forecast is on the UK economy, because it's going back and forth at the moment. The IMF um, are forecasting that we are into a contraction. There are some suggestions that we're teetering on a recession. But then, of course, yesterday with HSBC's pretty extraordinary third quarter results, they also said that they think there is going to be growth. So we'll just have to wait and see. Right. I guess uh, sentiment is tending towards a risk off um, at this point. But we have more data okay. there uh, from Transport for London as TFL. So the number of most uh, polluting vehicles driven in London has fallen by almost um, half. I guess that's uh, good news for the climate change issue. Well, I suppose it is a good thing for um, climate change, which is exactly why um, the ultra-low emission zone was introduced in the first place. Very, very controversial, um, this ULES scheme announced by uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. It was announced in the summer, but it's since been expanded to cover all boroughs of uh, the British capital. So basically, if you're driving a petrol car uh, that's more than 23 years old, you have to pay £12.50 every single day, which about... 13,000 naira and you drive into the capital. If you have a diesel car, I think it's got to be less than 10 years old. Um, and since the expansion, um, TFL have updated um, its progress report and they have announced that they have made over 27 million pounds. The bulk of this money, of course, is in the levy, but then also fines. If you come into the capital, you make a mistake, you don't pay um, that ULES fee, then you get an £180 fine to 200,000 naira you've got to pay every time you come into the capital and you miss the payment. One of the reasons why it is so controversial, because of course we are going through a cost of living crisis, people can't afford that. But, you know, the goal is to make um, the city of London one of the cleanest regions in the world. And given the fact that it's taken 80,000 older vehicles off the road in just four weeks, it does show that we are heading towards that. Right. I guess that's the power of fines uh, right there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Juliana, for the update. Thank you. Uh, let's get a check on uh, the crypto market now. See, uh, Bitcoin's uh, remained quite strong above that 33,800 level. Look at the color uh, on the board there. We see it's just Bitcoin and red, and we have some other uh, top cryptocurrencies, uh, some other pockets of red. Uh, right there, but green is the predominant color um, this morning there with uh, we'll see Ethereum, major cryptocurrencies we track right there in the green with Solana, deep green, link, uh, deep green and Atom um, there. So we're seeing uh, just Bitcoin there, slightly in the red, but it, red is the color there, even though it's 0.01% uh, a marginal drop uh, this morning. Let's look at the top cryptocurrencies we track now. we we'll see uh, the sentiment, 66, greed, yeah. So. Yeah, traders are back to greed mode at this time, showing its um, risk on for investors right there in the crypto market. Uh, we see the top cryptocurrencies we tracked this morning, 8 a.m., $34,347. Ethereum, $1,805. was holding the $1,600 level for the longest time. It was managed to break that and stand above it uh, with bullish sentiment in the market. Uh, BNB not doing so bad, $227, up 0.79%. Cardano uh, managed to break uh, past that 26 Cent level 25 26 cents now 30 cents 2.84 percent one of the big movers in the top 100 coins we track on crypto coin market cap and xrp trying to get to that 60 cents uh, level 3.87 percent the biggest mover uh, we have uh, this morning we look at the top gainers now we see the top gainers counter we see uh, who's topping that counter for the top gainers one of the big cryptocurrencies on the uh, top 100 uh, coins that we track in the market so that's how the top um, coins we, we track are doing uh, right now. Let's bring in Solomon Amunde now, uh, financial market analyst. Uh, great to have you, Solomon. Good morning. Good morning, Ladi. Good morning. Yeah, so a, a popular analyst is predicting a mega bull run if Bitcoin breaks above the 36,000 level. What is he seeing here? What are the signs? So basically, what traders are seeing on the charts is um, a golden cross that is forming. And this actually happens when the 50-day moving average crosses the 200-day moving average from below. This is what gives us what we refer to as a golden cross. And making use of um, past historical data, whenever this happens, we tend to see the price of Bitcoin surge to about 5 to 10%. So that's what we're expecting soon. 
Yeah, quite, quite uh, big expectations there. And I'm, I'm guessing if it doesn't break that level, is it down from there? Well, we can't really say it's going down from there because um, there's a huge liquidity around um, 36 to about 38k. So we're expecting Bitcoin to make a move to tap into that liquidity, after which we expect to see a huge dump down to about $8,000. And um, a few days ago, we see uh, Maestro Bot was hacked and today, Unibot was hacked with over $600,000 uh, stolen. What is really happening to the Telegram bot? And uh, to educate our viewers that don't know about Telegram bots, um, refresh our mind, What's, what are Telegram bots again? So basically, Telegram bots are just um, applications running within your Telegram chat app, and it allows you to be able to conduct different transactions. In the crypto space, it allows you to buy and sell cryptocurrencies via on-chain transactions. There are also so many other stuff you can do with Telegram bots, but relative to crypto, it's basically trading, buying and selling. So um, in the case of the hack, um, Maestro Boot experienced the hack last week, losing almost 600K dollars. It wasn't the fault of the users, basically. It was a smart contract bug and it was exploited. Now, Uniboot is seeing something similar. In the early hours of today, they saw one of the contracts they recently deployed over the weekend. It was actually deployed, it was actually exploited, a bug in it, a callback bug, and it allowed the exploiter to actually make away with over 560k dollars. But currently, the issue has been fixed, and users making use of this boat have been advised to revoke access or simply put, they can move the funds to another wallet. And also, those that are lost funds, they'll be compensated or refunded. Yeah, definitely not a good time to lose funds in any investment, you know, with cost of living crisis. Uh, investors are already squeezed on all angles. So, but, but how would you advise, you know, traders that want to trade around these uh, bots? Um, what's the best strategy? So basically, the best strategy is use the bots as an alternative. Now, people are fond of um, making use of their wallets to hold all their funds. Ideally, what you're supposed to do is the funds you want to use to buy a token or sell a token should only be what you move to the boat. And once you've made profit, you move out to the funds. So simply put, don't use the, the boat as your actual wallet. Just make use of it temporarily to carry out transactions. And it's also advisable not to make use of bulk transactions. And most importantly, seek um, education and guidance from a mentor before you start trying to navigate how to make use of these boats because they, you can actually lose all your funds if you don't do it right. Very, very important. Uh, and this is the final trading day of uh, October. Um, historically, October is uh, normally a bad month for, you know, U.S. stocks, and we've seen that, you know, play out this month. How do you see price action in October, and what are you seeing for November? So October, we saw a breakout. Talking about Bitcoin, we saw a breakout and we've moved from 26K to as much as 35, 36K. I see November as the month for consolidation. So I expect us to do some heavy serious consolidation between the range of 34K and about 31K. Afterwards, I see the charts breaking down to about 25, 26K dollars per Bitcoin. So I would say October, November rather, is the, is the month for altcoins to start thriving. While um, for Bitcoin, we'll would see majorly consolidation and distribution in the month of November. Uh, looking at November, what uh, trend do you think is going to rule, you know, in the month of November? And what kind of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies will profit from that trend? Okay, so, so, so far, so good. Altcoins haven't really rallied much in the month of um, October, especially DEXs. Looking at PancakeSwap, they bought over 8,000 tokens within the last 48 hours, and they haven't moved an inch. It's still about a dollar to cent. I'm expecting DEXs to lead the way in the month of November, the likes of um, PancakeSwap, Uniswap, BuySwap, and so many others. Then I'm also expecting um, real-world assets to start picking up steam and some L2, looking at them, um, Arbitrum, Optimism, and so many other L2s out there. I'm looking at them making considerable gains in the month of November, talking about 30 to 50% profits in the month of November. All right, definitely. We'll be looking out for how it plays out in November, in November. talking about price action in the crypto market. Thank you so much, uh, Solomon Amunde, financial market analyst. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenny. And we've got a quick check on our top gainers this morning. We see Rune, uh, $2.90, topping the counter. Double-digit gain there, 18.59%. Solana also back on the top gainers counter. We've seen investors quite bullish on Solana at this point, $36.34, up 11.72%. 
And are we $5.76, 11.37%. Let's get a check on the top losers uh, this morning. Let's see who's topping the losers counter. Uh, we'll see render token uh, topping the counter 2.48%. Profit taking on that uh, down 3.98%. And Axie Infinity also on the top losers counter there, 2.07%. So that's how the market um, is looking today. We'll see it's still uh, greed right here in the crypto uh, space. And that's the show today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. And remember, you can watch this again on our YouTube channel. Just flip over to YouTube, search for Channel Television, and you can watch all our production. Thank you for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Have a profitable day.